So I found this really, really useful example. It's microorganisms instead of a whole lot of diagrams and, and drawings. And sorry, but I'm still going to have drawings in my talk. So let's talk about these New Zealand frogs. So I studied these in my PhD in Sydney. They are so cute. They are native to New Zealand. They are vulnerable species. They're present in several fragmented populations on the North Island of New Zealand, and they're super primitive, primitive and super unique, and super cute, they don't have feet. And they live in these cool little forests um, in the Coromandel. So we were looking at these because they are of conservation concern. So we were using the MHC class 2, which is a particular MHC gene that provides resistance to bacteria and fungi and parasites, and these are the common diseases present in our frogs. We use the MHC to give us an idea of the immunological capacity of our population. And then we're about to talk one. Good. So this is all hoping to feed back into conservation of these species. So what do we find? We found lots of MHC gene variants. Excellent. However, we identified one population that had only two MHC variants. That bad. This may mean that this population may not have those important resistance alleles that are called variants that are important for its survival into the future. So this population will need careful management. But I like the MHC, and we wanted to have a look at the other one. So in our other populations where we have lots of diversity, lots of gene variants, we actually found that each population was essentially unique in what genes they had. This is actually kind of weird for MHC. I studied the Clevacus before and we found genes that were present in the population that have been separated for thousands and thousands of years. So what's happening here? And this is probably selection. Bear with me. Going to diagrams. So let's talk about selection on the MHC. So we've already established different DNA sequences will provide resistance to different pathogens. Awesome. Let's think about a conceptual population. Here we have four different pathogens and Four different MHC variants will, which will provide resistance to each respective pathogen. In a population, you'll have lots of different pathogens, and in a sort of reaction or a response to that, you will have an, an assortment of MHC um, gene variants that sort of complement that diversity. So, for instance, if we have an increase in these viruses, you'll see an increase in the appropriate MHC gene variants that will provide resistance. Furthermore, if you then see an increase in bacterial, then you'll see an increase in these red variants, which provide resistance to that. This is sort of like a co-evolutionary arms race between your genes and pathogens. So if you take these two examples and consider them to be two separate populations, it's quite easy to understand that based on different histories of pathogens, you will see different um, gene variants. And that's what we're seeing in our frogs. But this is actually really, really cool, you know, like, how is selection driving MHC diversity? In fact, is it a little bit close-minded? Let's look at the MHC. I want to know what's happening at all the immune genes. It's a little bit hard to go all these pathogens, all these immune genes. What's happening? We need to simplify the system. That's where I started my postdoc. We're looking at selection for the immune response in chickens. This is my version of chickens. These are our population of white leg from chickens, and what we're doing is we are taking a whole genome approach to see how selection is impacting immune genes. We're using sheep red blood cells, these lucky little blood cells here, and we are, this is sort of a challenge. It's a foreign antigen or a foreign, not necessarily a pathogen, but a foreign body that the chicken will mount an immune response for. We will, as I, as I say, inject this antigen, measure the immune response, and start selectively breeding the ones with a good immune response together and the ones with good low response together. And we do this 39 times. So we have 39 generations of selective breeding for high and low antibody response. So what we have is, this is just in, 30, in generation 32, but we already have a seven-fold difference in the immune response. And that's kind of amazing. But how is this happening? How many genes are involved? How much of the genome is involved? What are the key genes involved in this? We're using whole genome sequencing, blah, blah, blah. Basically, we can compare the populations that have a high response and a low response. By comparing their genomes, we can identify regions that are very, very different. Um, and these are probably contributing to the difference between these immune responses. What do I mean by this? Let's go to another awesome diagram. 
So, being a region by distance, let's consider one region, one gene variant. Gene. In our original population, we had two different gene variants. One actually had a benefit for the immune response. One didn't. Over 39 generations, you then see selection in the changes. And throughout my work, we found many, many, many regions and many immune genes. But essentially, it all comes back to this whole idea of the immune system is complex. And maybe I should have said genomics for top. Thank you. Thank you.